I was giving myself one year to try this out and I would know in a year if it was working or not. And if it wasn't working, I could always go grab another sales job. And it got to be the point where it's like, if I don't do this now, am I going to look back when I'm 45 and have a bunch of kids and, <laughs> you know, and say like, God, I had this kind of fun thing going yeah. on and, and I never did it, you know, and would I really, really regret that. And that's what I was so afraid of the regret. This is Startup to Storefront. Today's guest is Christina Party of Shit That I Knit, a company that creates high quality knitwear, accessories, and puns. Seriously, you don't name your company Shit That I Knit if you don't have a great sense of humor. But you should go check them out at shitthatiknit.com. And while you're there, you'll be glad to know that they've given our listeners a discount. And you have a special thank you promo code for all the listeners. Yes, if you guys want to use Startup15 at checkout, that'll get you 15% off on our website. Once again, you can use the code STARTUP15 at checkout for 15% off your order. So listen in as we cover everything from how she outsourced her production to a team of highly skilled women in Peru, why building a great team around her has alleviated any fears of taking maternity leave, and how sliding into Katie Kirk's DMs led to a friendship and more exposure for the brand. Now, back to the episode. Welcome yeah. to the podcast. We're here with Christina. Hi, Christina. Hi, Dio. Thank you what for having me. What is the name of your company? It's Shit That I Knit. I love it. How did you start Shit That I Knit? It's kind of a long story, but I started I started knitting when I was 10. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom taught me how to knit, so it's always been something that I love. And in college, I was knitting a lot, not doing a lot of my work. And my sister said, why don't you stop texting us photos of <laughs> shit you had knit and, and make a website called Shit That I Knit? And they were definitely making fun of me, but and I you did? and I did it. I I got a WordPress what were you knitting? blog. I was knitting really weird things. I mean, I was knitting like mittens and hats and normal, you know, your normal accessories. But okay. really, what I got addicted to was knitting these little toy bats. Like they looked like bats that had arms. <laughs> okay. And at the same time, I was binge watching Breaking Bad and like not not writing mm -hmm. my final art history paper. Like I almost actually failed out. So this is like more than a hobby. You were legitimately... I was a little bit having an addiction problem. Yeah. Knitting. But so I was having fun also uploading photos to the WordPress blog that no one read. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and what that, year was this when you started the company? That was 2012. That was just like starting the blog okay. and it was just silliness. Okay. Um, graduated from college, got a real nine to five and it was always my fun fact like i'm christina i'm 22 and i have a knitting blog shit that i knit.com and yeah. people would always laugh but it wasn't until the fall of 2014 that i went to a market in boston to see if i could sell the shit that i knit yeah so right? have you yeah. been i have so i used to have a bow tie company no way about 10 years ago and cool. we would um so it was actually how we launched originally really and so we'd go there every Makes sunday sense. and we would um sometimes make like a thousand dollars selling these bow ties that's Which really cool. Our gimmick was we gave free bow tying lessons. That's a good lesson. That was lesson. the gimmick. Um, I can tie a bow tie. My dad only wears bow ties if you have any extra. Self tie. Self tie bow ties. Oh, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, so you're saying your dad only wears like ones he can tie himself? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. a bow tie guy. That's great. It yeah. says a lot about him. So, so was great. So, if people don't know who are listening, so was kind of like the Melrose Trading Post of LA. Okay. Um, basically, just you set up, you, you spend maybe like 100 bucks for the day, 10 by 10, 10. Yeah. And then you're just out there hopefully making some money. Yeah. So you started, you, you brought products to SOA. Yeah, we did that for two weekends a lot because, you know, selling hats, you can't be there in the summer months when it's right. like 95 degrees it's a seasonal out. seasonal. Yeah, actually starting seasonal. to sweat wearing this hat. This hat is <laughs> Yeah, you can always take it off. It's yeah, a very yeah, hot yeah. merino hat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the one downside to them is that I want to wear them in October, but it's just, it's just, too, just too hot. Um, but we did the last two weekends in October – and it went really well. I mean, I had never done anything like it. Like yeah. we had a pop tent from Walmart and a tablecloth from my mom, my parents' house. <laughs> like it was, you know, like some flowers and right. a sign from Vista Print. And I was like, oh, I don't know. And it went really well. People love the name. Yeah. And everything sold out within those two weeks. So that's how we got our. That's great. Our first. But so it still had like, a job at the time. Okay. Yeah. It was not paying the bills. Right. <laughs> and then at that point, were you like, how do I make more of this product? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to keep up. Um, not only from like a carpal tunnel perspective, but also sure. a social life and keeping up with demand is hard. <laughs> so after those October weekends, we got picked up by a store, like very local stuff, mm -hmm. but couldn't keep up with holiday demand, just filling orders on, 
on again my very dinky website and uh decided in february to see if i could get women to knit for me so i posted on instagram you know would you rather stay at home on a friday night and you know knit and drink a glass of wine than go out if so you're you're my kind of girl you know knit for me and i yeah. figured that no one would sign up mm -hmm. that it would just be embarrassing uh but in the morning had like 30 applications from oh wow girls my age who love to do exactly what i like to do which is netflix and knit and you know netflix and knit. yeah what netflix kind of a following that? did That's you have great. at this point not a huge sure. one but like mm -hmm. it was very knitting heavy following sure. so it made sense that we had this like concentrated okay. group but probably had like 2,000 followers on Instagram or something. So to get 30 people willing yeah. to, to sign up for that is not a bad ratio. Yeah, it was it was surprising. <laughs> yeah. So did you um, hire them all? <clears throat> slowly but surely, yeah. I, I wow. We had a team of about 30 women here in Boston. Um, and it was really a huge learning curve for me. I had never done anything like it. And the business model was a complete mess. I mean, we were I was buying yarn retail, mm -hmm. meeting these women wherever it was convenient for them. So whether it was like a coffee shop before work or a bar after work mm -hmm. or swinging by my parents' house just to grab yarn, go home, knit it from home and bring it bring back the finished product. Um, and then actually trying on that hat once they brought in the finished product and realizing like this wasn't knit yeah. properly. I was going to say the QAQC must have been a nightmare, it's a right? tough, yeah. Everyone knits a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um. And like, I didn't want to not pay someone for their work or, sure. <laughs> and I'm not like super detail oriented. So I'd be like, this doesn't totally fit, uh, <laughs> but here's, here's your money. And you know, I don't want to deal with this. So it was, it was great and a great experience to learn anything about quality control or sure. just production on a very small scale. But it was, it was how we got our like first inventory built up. And are you still doing SOA primarily or is it everything online now? No, we, we just did those two weekends okay. um, back in 2014. Our price point was definitely a little too high okay. for so. Um, I mean, even now, it, our hats are 125 A lot of the stuff being sold there now is like a little more gift of like candles and soap and like lower price point items. So yeah. our price point was definitely a little tough. It looks you know, for yeah. hat. Um, Especially at yeah. SOA. They're, yeah, at They're SOA. thinking like everything needs to be 30, 40 bucks. Right, yeah. yeah. And there are hats being sold there for 30 or 40 bucks. Um, right. And it's just a little more of a premium product. So, um, no, we haven't done any, any more SOA. Got it. Yeah. And so then what happened after? So now you have your 30 knitters. 30 knitters. I still had a full-time job. I was not doing a very what good job. What was your full-time job? I was doing sales for a digital retargeting company. Okay. Um, Thrilling. It was really thrilling stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's really exciting. It's exciting. I can see why you left it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell them that. Right. They're very nice people. Um, but it was really good money. I mean, sales is yeah. great money. I, I had been at another tech company prior to that. So I was used to having a pretty cushy paycheck. And, you know. How was hard fun. was it leaving? It wasn't that hard. I mean, oh, that's good. I, I had had a lot of conversations. I had been doing this for about eight months. Okay. And... I had talked to a lot of different mentors and said, like, you know, what do you think of this idea? And finally got to the point where one of my mentors said, what are you doing? You can't be doing both things. You have to give this a shot. So I went in the next day and told my boss and they totally got it. They were like, yeah, you're knitting in the conference room. <laughs> like, please sleep. <laughs> please sleep. It's like, you're fired. Exactly. You're, you have not hit your quota in months. And But they were very nice and, like, excited for me and said, like, you can come back, like, when it doesn't work out. Right. But they... The subtle. They didn't say that. They didn't say that, but they said, you know, you can Most always come back. Most companies do. They're like, yeah, we'll leave the door open for you. Yeah, it. like, yeah. you know, that's a good yeah. way to leave. Yeah. And I was like, okay, sounds good. Um, and so I told my parents I was giving myself one year to try this out, and I would know in a year if it was working or not. And if it wasn't working, I could always go grab another sales job. Yeah. Um, and what, what so. was the advice your mentor gave you? Just like you have to do it 100%? Yeah. I mean, like, he and I were meeting at that point, like, every – you know, twice a month or something or, or more and mm -hmm. just having all these conversations. And, and it got to be the point where it's like, if I don't do this now, am I going to look back when I'm 45 and have a bunch of kids and, <laughs> you know, and say like, God, I had this kind of fun thing going yeah. on and, and I never did it, you know, and would I really, really regret that? And that's what I was so afraid of the regret. The regret. Yeah. I think that's valid. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's so true. When I meet old people, or older people. Old, old 45 year olds. Old 45 year olds with a bunch of kids. I just, I was invited to a party recently and the, um, the friend, my friend was turning 50 and her father was there and he was actually on like the Syracuse football team that won the championship in 1959. Hmm. And just to hear all of his stories, he had been on the trading floor in New York. Yeah. 
And then I was like, you know, that it's cool to hear the stories. Yeah. And that's really all you have at the end of the day. Right. But when you're older, so when hearing it from him, there's no ego. You're removed of all the ego and all like the the competition yeah. of it. And so I was like, oh, it's just so nice to hear it. Right. Like, Whereas you're meeting, if you meet someone your own age, there's, there's usually some ego or there's some like, oh, I got to be the best or I need it now. Yeah. Afraid of failure. And I was like, it was just so refreshing. Yeah. To hear that perspective. Yeah. Did you... Did you save a little bit of money before you left your job or what? Okay. Yeah, I had saved a bunch of, a good amount of money. I also moved home with my mm-hmm. parents. Smart. Um, Super smart. So they're great roommates. The amenities at their house are very nice. <laughs> yeah. Dinners are delicious. Um, but it was a hard thing to do as a 25 year old, obviously. Sure. It's like, oh, God. Your, your dating life is Yeah, really put on pause. Um, yeah. It was really a luxury to be able to do that, I think, if I weren't able to move home. I'm always willing to admit that I'm very, very lucky to have supportive parents yeah. who allow me to do this and who, when I said I was quitting, they were like, okay, <laughs> but they were, they didn't say no way. Right. I'm not going to support you. So it's such a big piece. I think I lived at home for two years just to save money yeah. before moving to Boston. And it was so, it's a, it's a game changer. Yeah. It completely gave me a runway that right. I would have never had. And yeah. it wasn't like I saved a hundred grand and maybe I saved like 30 grand or something, but yeah. it was enough for sure to yeah. make it easy. Really helps. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the dinner also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <free laughs> Laundry. Food. Yeah. There are some perks to come There are some serious perks. My mom's really fun. We get our nails done, you know. So had so I, had, I had about 25000 saved. Yeah. And so I was able to put that towards buying yarn and paying for the knitting team. But dur- So when I, I quit in May of 2015, mm-hmm. knowing that I would spend that whole summer working with the team in Boston to work up an inventory and launch a Kickstarter in September. So Oh, nice. It, you know, we ran through my savings pretty quickly. Yeah. And but then you did the launch. Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. How did that go? It went really well. I had only planned to raise fifteen thousand dollars. We did it in like fourteen hours or something, like wow. under twenty four hours. Kickstarter is so much work. <laughs> 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 Have you guys ever done a Kickstarter? Not personally. No. No. Um, I just think it's more work than pe- people assume. You just throw up a video and people will come. But I really, while the video was being made, I was working so hard on getting influencers to agree to post about it on the day of the launch, uh, media, anyone who would talk about it so that when we launched it wouldn't just fall on deaf ears. Um, and that took a lot of work. Luckily, it was back in 2015 when like Kickstarter was still... You know, it's kind of hot. It's kind of hot. I mean, still, there still are very successful campaigns, but I think much harder today to get an influencer to say yes to posting about a Kickstarter launch. For sure. So was lucky for that timing, and yeah. So when we launched, we had like a Forbes article come out and a couple local publications, and that's um, amazing. Yeah, so we were able to to hit that goal, and then initially, and in the end, raise twenty five thousand, which all went towards. Hats at a discount. So people just bought hats okay. at a discounted price. And it was great. I mean, it wasn't a ton of money. And like, there's definitely easier ways to get $25,000. Sure. But what was great about it was it was a great marketing tool. We had this amazing video made. No equity. No equity. And we had, you know, 200 people wearing our hats the first season. Yeah. By Christmas, we had all these like customers who, who were already brand advocates. Yeah. Um, and at this point, was your company mostly local? Like, is, are the people buying your hats mostly from New England? They were at the time, yeah. Okay. It was definitely, you know, friends of friends of friends. Sure. Um, but we still have some customers today who still have their Kickstarter hat. They're like, I you know, supported you in the very beginning, and, and it shows the quality of the hat. Although when I see them, I'm like, please let me give you a new hat. That looks very yeah. I was going to ask what the differences up. were between that product and the one that you're putting out now. It's just like a slightly different yarn. Yeah, they're, they're, more, they're just nicer now. Uh, they're nicer. So whenever companies launch, let's say locally, right, it becomes really tough to get into other markets. So in yeah. this case, getting into the West Coast, are there any things that you did in particular to get out to the West Coast in terms of sales? We've done a lot. I mean, our hat naturally fits really well into like the ski yeah. scene. Um, and my sister Colorado. lives in Jackson Hole. Okay. So we've done a lot out there. So we have actually, our our best markets go Boston, New York, Chicago, Jackson Hole. <laughs> um, wow. And it's a small community, but I cannot walk down the street there now without seeing five or 10 hats quickly. Yeah. And Instagram has been huge and in allowing us to have more of a national reach. Yeah, Instagram's um, pretty unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing how you can connect with literally anyone. Right. As you scaled your company, right? Mm-hmm. So so are, were you still working with the 30 knitters after the Kickstarter campaign or what started to shift so yeah. that you could really create high, you know, high volume? After the Kickstarter campaign, we had that season. We got everyone their hats by the promised time. 
um, and didn't have a lot of money left in the bank. Sure. So looking at the business plan and talking to people, it, it just wasn't very scalable. Um, and I definitely wasn't going to be able to raise a ton of money having this sort of mixed group here in Boston and the prices we were at. So I started doing a lot of research on South America and it's where we were getting our yarn. Mm -hmm. A lot of yarn comes from Peru. So started doing some research and I literally was just like Googling something and found this nonprofit in Colorado who connects artisan groups to brands. And I called this woman out of the blue and she put me in touch with our group that we still work with in Peru. But it just was like not only like it's not that much cheaper to produce it down there. What it really is is they have the the infrastructure. They have this network of women who who are so incredibly talented. Um, all these networks of women around Lima who can mm -hmm. knit for us, so we can scale. Versus having thirty people who go on vacation or yeah. You know. And did you go visit? Um, I actually we started the relationship just on Skype. Hmm. Um, we just chatted. Uh, so from February twenty sixteen to October. I just was on Skype and then we went down in October That's awesome. um, to visit, but it was all just like yeah, yeah, yeah. sending we'll my life savings. And <laughs> right, right. Did you raise money between those two years? I raised like a very small friends and family round okay. just to finance this inventory. Yeah. Um, still was living at home, you know, wasn't that glamorous. Got it. What was it like going to Peru and meeting some of the, the people who knit for you? It was pretty incredible. You know, I think I just couldn't even imagine what that looked like. And so going down, all the women that we employ can knit from home. So they live, you know, Lima is a huge sprawling city. Mm -hmm. You're not from, from there. You're yeah. from Lima. Yeah. I was born there. Yeah. Um, it's a huge city, as you know, and like yeah. the traffic's terrible. And so for these women to go to work, doesn't really make sense for them to drive two and a half hours back and forth. They totally. may have two or three kids. Um, and so this enables them to stay in their community, create a new community, which is these women that they knit with yeah. and take care of their kids and not leave kids with unreliable childcare. So to see that impact, like I definitely need to brush up on my Spanish so I can understand <laughs> it a little bit better. But the hugs and the crying and the impact that we're making that other brands are making by employing these women is pretty incredible. So yeah, it, it's definitely every time I go down, I'm, I have to like sort of like guard myself emotionally because I, I think I would just cry too much. It's just too nice. Peru's <laughs> that kind of place. It's a it'll get you on all the emotions. Yeah, it's so, such nice people. I'm gonna cry. Yeah, now. It's, <laughs> I'm hormonal. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. Yeah. Um, in terms of like a, is 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 the wool made in Peru too? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's in Arequipa. Oh, Arequipa. Yeah. Yes. It's um, like the ski city of Peru. Yes. Yeah, that's where you go to ski if you're interested. Yeah, it's yeah. big mountains. Huge. Uh, much bigger than I, and it's so funny when we, last time we were down there, we said we we're going to Arequipa to visit the yarn facility and everyone in Lima was like, Oh, <laughs> like, and they're like, why not Cusco? Like they're, and they suggest other places like, cause it's for business. Like I'm not, it's yeah. not for fun, but it's a beautiful city. It is. I don't it's know. Totally it's got this gorgeous. bad rap. There's two versions of Arequipa that a lot of people. Yeah. Like. And so I've had friends that have gone and experienced both different ones. The yeah. people that experienced the not so good version never want to go back to Peru again. Interesting. And the people who experience the other version are like, oh, this is great. It's yeah. almost like they get an Aspen type feel. Yeah. Versus... You look up and there's this mat. What's that mountain? I don't know. I forget the it's name insane. of it. It's insane. Like it's like it's beautiful. Boom. Yeah. And the monasteries and it's just like gorgeous. And we drove all around and saw where they actually hand dye some of our yarn and like watch the women, how they like hand paint it. And wow. it was just a really cool experience. And they make, I mean, Peru has an amazing textiles industry, so they, do, yeah. they make other types of yarn for lots of different things. But My aunt runs a company there, and they used to produce all of Lacoste's merchandise yeah. there. Yeah, you would never know. Which people don't know, yeah, yeah which is pretty Huge cool. Huge designers, and making like very industrial type of, of thread and yarn. It yeah. just, they took us on a tour, and I was like, I could have used just the tourist version of this tour. <laughs> it was like five hours long through like football wow. length facilities and like all the different ways that they pick alpaca. And it was really very educational, but I was like very tired by the time. I was like, oh my God, this is. When you first got really into long. knitting, right? What did you ever think the company would be this big, or what kind of products did you always well, intend to focus time, on? So. <laughs> <laughs> so you knew. So you had it mapped I knew. Out. I had the whole plan. But even when I. Started it. I don't know. I think I've always had like dreams of something big for myself. So I think like embarrassingly, like, yeah, I kind of thought yeah. maybe we could get to this point, but I never envisioned the kind of work it would entail or. And how has your product line changed from when you, let's say 2015 to today? Today? Um, I mean, honestly, not 
not like in a crazy way. Okay. We've always stuck to a very simple product line. One from a capital perspective, I've never, we never had enough money to like test out new products and be like, now we're going to do belts and now we're going to do. Sure. Um, and I always wanted to stick to one size fits most. Um, so from an inventory perspective, we weren't dealing with small, medium, large. It makes it a lot easier. A lot easier. Yeah. yeah. Um, inventory is still really hard, so I, I can't imagine mixing sizes into the group. Right. But So we've really stuck with hats, mittens, like winter accessories, and then we have tested out some summer products. Our, our summer wraps made of baby alpaca have been really popular, so that's helped even out the sales cycle a bit. Um, yeah. But nothing compares to the November, December buying of hats and mittens and totally. neckies and stuff. So. And then in terms of how you think about scaling your business, is it getting into more shops or is it growing the young? Obviously it's a mix of both, but yeah. what, what do you prefer? I prefer the direct consumer. I think um, it allows us to really control our brand story. Obviously like the margin better. Um, yeah. So I think our goal right now is just to continue to grab up different geographies. Um, we still are, I mean, we've grown a lot, but we're still very much a New England brand. And mm-hmm. so... So grabbing, you know, New York and the Midwest and out West even more is definitely a goal of ours. That's and awesome. We work with lots of stores and hopefully a big retailer at some point. But. And recently you met Katie Couric. Yeah. What was that like? Well, I met her last year. I um, slid into her DMs. <laughs> uh, and I, because she was doing a gift guide for Gifts That Give Back, and I figured she'd obviously love our story. Of course. Um, I was like, this is perfect. So emailed her and and then once I sent her the information and she got back to me I was like why don't I grab your email uh so I can send you more information so once she highlighted us in her little Instagram gift guide um I asked her out on a date I asked her if she wanted to grab coffee and and she said yes um that's so cool so she's so nice she's the loveliest person in the entire world I just (laughs) adore her um and she's been such a great brand advocate uh this year they put us in her she has a newsletter that started this fall so she added us to her gift guide in her newsletter she instagrams about us all the time she connects me with great people um that's great and she's just she's a fan she's a fan and i'm a total diehard fan of hers um so she's just been wonderful And on the business side have you seen that help tremendously yeah it really has i mean she's just so well connected and people just adore her um so a lot of customers have come to us saying like, oh, I found you in Katie's gift guide or I saw she Instagrammed about you. This is so cool. And people send it to me as if I don't know. They're like, look, you're in Katie Gu- Kirk's gift guide. I'm like, I know. It's <laughs> That's very- so cool. As if she wasn't going to tell you ahead of time. I know. Or like as if I don't stalk her already. I'm like, oh, I'm, Katie. I'm aware. Katie yeah. Katie does again. She um, didn't tell me. I've gotten a lot of messages like, look. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> cool. But so we've gotten definitely a lot of, of customers out of her and. Who was your first hire outside of people that were knitting? Um, Sarah. She's actually not here right now. Um, oh. she, Sarah started as an intern for me a couple of years ago. She went, she goes, she went to BC. Mm-hmm. Um, so did a summer internship and then stayed on part-time helping me fulfill orders. So it was just me and Sarah. And then she started full-time after she graduated. So she's our operations manager. She actually runs this business. Yeah, <laughs> she knows all the inventory everything. Management. Yeah, sure. Yeah, she's on the phone with Prue every week hmm. at least, um, and then just like. Does she, she speak Spanish? No, <laughs> I need to get her to. Uh, Where were you guys working out of? We were downstairs in this building. Okay. Um, had a much smaller space, uh, so luckily we love this little building. They've, yeah. they've allowed us to hop around to bigger, you know, as we grow. So we're moving in like two weeks. Same uh, building. Same just building, just like literally room. next, like the studio next door. Uh, yeah, so people listening, we're in Austin, Massachusetts, in yeah. probably a 3,000 square foot space, something like that. Yeah. And there's about six, seven people working here, yeah. right? Yeah, we're very there's collaborative. there's a ton of inventory, yeah. which, is, which is great. <laughs> a lot of shit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we like to keep all the inventory in-house. I think because I started making it all, I like still need to touch it. I like need to feel it. I need to see it. It really drives me like in August to see all the inventory come in. It's like, okay, we got our work cut out. We yeah. gotta sell, sell, sell. Um, it's at your time frame. So for all the winter stuff you want it in August. Yeah. Latest August. Okay. And that's when you Probably do product shots. July. Yeah. Um, well we get product shots done like ahead of time, but like our first big shipments come in in July and August. Yeah. And so in terms of scaling a company like yours, you mentioned um, Sarah, operation mm-hmm. side of it. What other things become super important? Because it sounds like you have a pretty good control. The, in, the scalability of the relationship with Peru seems there. Yeah. And so yeah. at least from a volume, you can tune it up or down. Yep. Uh, but in terms of bringing people in-house, is it marketing? Is it 
Yeah, so our second hire was marketing. Um, Tori is our director of marketing. So helping with like all all things digital marketing from like ads. And we had never done Facebook or okay. Instagram ads before. So learning that landscape, email marketing, we redid our website. Obviously, the website's very important when you have a direct consumer brand. Totally. You want to make sure it's shoppable. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we have events and communications and customer service and fulfillment. So... Do you guys spend a tremendous amount on ads? Um, no. Okay. No. And we really like just started to dip our toes into it. It's it's a whole new world. Um, and really the way that people find us is definitely more organic. We do a lot of earned media, which is where Meg, our director of communications, comes in. So Shout out to Meg. Shout out to Meg. <laughs> um, so making sure that people are seeing either stories about our team in Peru or, you know, the brand story or just product placements for gift guides um, or on influencers. So we have a lot of Mm -hmm. influential people wearing our things. So it takes a couple different touch points for people to buy. So the ads are sort of the follow up, like what I used to sell, digital retargeting, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I always think about that with the yield, right? And so as an entrepreneur, you have to, you want to put your time on to where you're going to have the most yield. Yeah. And the easiest, even on our podcast, we think about this like, Oh, if we got Katie Couric on as an easy example, then you're not, you don't have to spend a million dollars on, let's say Facebook right. ads because yeah. you can get someone with an audience it's and then larger. it's yeah. much easier to do that. Yeah. And much so that's cheaper, it, much cheaper. Yeah. Right. And it's like a 2020, like 2019, totally different landscape yeah. than yeah. when you first started. Right. Which is um, crazy to think about. Yeah. It's been the, yeah. And, and influencers have always been like a big way, but we haven't paid anyone to wear our stuff. So it's, yeah, it's very cheap. Great. Which also makes it kind of interesting when we go to raise money. People are like, well, where are you going to spend, like marketing, where are you going to spend this? Because we don't have any marketing spend. We're like, right. you know, it's going to go to much scrappier, different ways of getting our name out there than just putting money behind a Facebook ad. Yeah, no, I love it. You know. So are you yeah. raising money? Do you plan on raising money? We raise money this summer, um, okay. and then we'll probably raise more in like a year and Is a it half. like a seed, Series A? Seed, a yeah, seed, seed round? round, yeah. Okay. Um, we did convertible notes, so Great. I will be doing more. Yeah. How much do you want to raise? Fun. I'm not really sure yet. I have to figure that out with our CFO. That's yeah. another hire that's been you really got a helpful. CFO. Yes. Uh, on demand CFO. For any entrepreneurs out there, I highly recommend Googling an on demand CFO. That's a new term. I've never heard of yeah. on demand. Yeah. On demand or fractional CFO. How did you find your CFO? Um, actually, my sister in law, he worked at a company where my sister in law was. Um, so okay. he comes in once a week. And it's not an accountant or a bookkeeper. We're talking about like bigger projections or how to raise money or yeah, you know stuff. I didn't go to business school, so um, you like, you what is a convertible in note? School. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, uh, and then you know, obviously learning about it, but having someone to sort of guide that and make sure that we're making good financial decisions. And and you pay him hourly, or is he like yeah. a monthly retainer? Hourly. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's great, Peter. I'll go meet with him after this. Actually, this I mean, is the new thing. I think there's like the gig economy, right? But then there's yeah. like a tremendous amount of executive CFOs, yeah, chief revenue officers, people like that. That for sure you should just be able to hire. Yeah, because you don't need one all day. I and mean, if you're a CFO, you really don't need to be in a chair all day for no. one company either. No, he works for like five or six other companies, and yeah, and That's it, great. he's like a curious guy. So prior to this, was not like in the knit hat industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My sister-in-law worked at a robotics company, so I'm like, oh, wouldn't you love to come interview at Shit That I Knit? <laughs> uh, but he's got. A wealth of knowledge. On I was just thinking, like, that. of quit. If, let's pretend we quit our jobs, and then we joined shit that I knit, and I'm yeah. explaining it to my mom. So what, she's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, oh, "I joined a knitting company." Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, like dreams. Yeah, they came true. Yeah, that's so finally. Cool. Yeah. So now that you've got all the um, the ladies in Peru working for you, what is the amount of time that it takes to go from like getting the yarn to a finished hat? Like, how much lead time do you need to have like one product roll off the line? Our yarn takes a long time to make. We mm-hmm. This yarn that we make um, is not typical of Peru, so it's not like stock yarn. It's our own creation. So that takes anywhere from like I don't know, a couple months, especially if we're picking out a new color. Sure. So like two or three months-ish, and then it takes about a month to knit okay. all the things, um, depending on the order size, though. I mean, we start – we order for our that July shipment. We order that in like April. Um, from a cash flow perspective, kind of tough. Right. And then <laughs> that's really hurts in April. Yeah. Uh, really hurts in July as well. That's when your babies do. Yeah, exactly. It'll be a fun, stressful time. Oh. Yeah. All, all happening at once. Yeah. And then, so, I'll be on maternity leave. I won't deal with that. Smart. Uh, and then from a shipping perspective, 
are you shipping from Peru up here and mm-hmm. then you're just kind of holding on to them until they start selling out? Yeah. And then we ship them all out from here. Okay. So I never thought I'd be so into freight forwarding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really tight with our freight forwarders from Peru. And then, yeah, it comes up here. We keep it all in-house and then we ship it out to our customers. Because we, I mean, it's an expensive product. It's special. I want to make sure that it's, it when it reaches the customer, which might be their first ever interaction with us, it's like right. a really great experience. They love it. They have all the, we have dust bags and great packaging and stories about our knitting team and reusable materials and everything like that. So we want to make sure it's uh, it's not just like picked by some warehouse and that sent out in a plastic bag. On the podcast, I think we've had over half of the founders that we've interviewed have been female. Really? From your perspective, there's a lot of female listeners. Yeah. What is it like? So you're, you're, you're pregnant currently. Yes. <laughs> is it, I, there's so many women that we speak to that are always worried about that. Like, what happens when I get pregnant? What yeah. happens to my company, right? Do I have to quit everything? Is it the end of the world? Is yeah. it not? How are you going into that? What advice can you give? What I, I would have felt that way if I didn't have such a good team now. Mm-hmm. I think I feel so confident in our team that I feel, like, really good about taking a break. I feel like I can be gone for weeks and the bus it's is still there. moving and people are so much more talented than me on what they're working on. And so... I feel great about trusting them with, with my, my baby. Yeah. Um, I also don't think I'll be taking a full four month maternity leave. It sure. might be like two weeks um, yeah. <laughs> and I'll be back on my emails. And, but it is, it is different because you're like, and even from like a raising money perspective, I wonder like, am I going to go into meetings super pregnant? And people are like, wait a second, like, is she really serious about this? Right. So that's unfortunate um, to even have that thought in the back of your head. But we also have a company that's so female focused with selling to women and made by women and this incredibly female team that I feel pretty supported. It's and, part of the story. Yeah, it's part right? of the story. And I think that's important. Yeah. yeah. That's great. So you set up the system for yourself to yeah. be able to at least take the time off and yeah. if needed, you're good. I think we'll be good. I hope so. Knock on wood. Yeah. I don't know. I also have been so busy that I keep forgetting I'm pregnant. So <laughs> <laughs> I keep being like, okay, after Christmas, I'll deal with that. So I, I was just a, a meeting uh, with a friend and she was like, so like, what's the nanny? What are you going to do? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> haven't gotten to I need that. to like sign up for all like, these mom's groups and stuff. And- yeah. And you got to sign them up for school immediately. Yeah. Right? Which is crazy. Yeah. I have a lot to do, but uh, we'll <laughs> but get through Christmas first. You have some time. Deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're raising, what else is on deck for 2020 for the, you, the company? Um, just like a lot of, I mean, we've been doubling year over year. So, you know, the more you double, the harder it is to double the next year. Um, so we just need it's to. It's funny that you look at it that way. <laughs> yeah. But it's so true. It's like easy to double <laughs> when you only do a hundred grand. You know? Right. Like, okay, next right. will be good. Uh, but now we're hitting numbers that are a little loftier. So and, and right now, I think our focus still is to stick with what we do really well, which is our hats and our winter accessories. So how are we going to um, go into new markets and create what we have in Boston, which is like this great cult following um, where people own 10 of our products and are obsessed wow. with it and tell all their friends and buy it as gifts. Like how do we create those customers in different markets? Yeah. Um, we're definitely really focusing on the Midwest and we're opening up these pop-ups that have been great. So that'll be... We'll be busy. Pop-ups in like different markets? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've had them in Boston and New York, so we're planning a couple new you ones You can see these in Aspen, no problem. Yeah. We these do really well in Aspen, yeah. These hats are amazing. Thanks. And I like how it says knit with amor in, yes. in, inside, which is really <laughs> the cool. The one Spanish word. <laughs> and there's an alpaca here. Yeah. Shout out to your designer. This yes. is beautiful. Thank you. This looks really, really good. Yeah. And it's well, not itchy. Okay. When you not do itchy. the pop-ups, are you going yourself or or is it like a team that you send out um we have claudia who's our um, events manager so she headed up our new york Mm pop-up um and then we hire people to work in the stores um especially here in boston where we sort of understand the area and we're able to fill that in with part-time people that's definitely a struggle and i think for any entrepreneurs opening up pop-up shops they know that getting this part-time retail help is really difficult yeah um so we're going to need to improve that system for next year to make sure that it's People who really are great for the brand and um, are behind, like excited to be there, and that's it, the hardest part. Yeah, it really is. Especially if it's a new market, we want to make sure that when people walk in, they they're getting the whole brand story, they're, and yeah, they're your ambassadors and yeah. the first point of contact. Yeah, and when it's a month long gig, it's a little harder to. How did you decide yeah. on the price point? Was that something that you came early on? I or? knew I wanted it to be a higher price point. I had bought a hat. I'm a big skier, and I had bought a hat. 
I think like Bogner or something like for 300 bucks. Okay. A little ridiculous, I recognize. Sure. Um, but I knew that there was a market for a higher end price point, but there's really no other hat in the market at this price point. It's either like your J. Crew or Gap for 40 bucks and it's made of 100% acrylic okay. yarn and polyester, or you've got a six, literally a $600 hat at Neiman Marcus that's just like a black cashmere toque right. thing. Like, you know, it's like a little. <laughs> It, I don't know, and it and it's six hundred dollars, and people buy it, so it's sort of both. Yeah, so both ends you view the it as like a an affordable luxury. Medium. Yes. Yeah. And they're really high quality. Um, I stand behind that they're hand knit. They are pieces, works of art. They're pieces. They're legitimately they're, yeah, pieces. Yeah, pieces, and yeah. um, and they're meant to last for a very long time. They're incredibly warm and soft. So. When you meet with investors, what's the one thing they always ask you, or the couple things? Are they like, "What's your product line? Where's it moving?" Yeah, product line is definitely a question how to make it less seasonal to round out the year. Right, because we um, have a lot of seasonality right now, I imagine, yeah. too. Yeah. And the cash flow is tough where we're buying things in April and not really selling them until November. That, And then, like, from a scalability perspective, like, it is hand-knit. Like, say, so, some insane celebrity warrior hat tomorrow, how would you keep up with that demand? You can't just, like, turn the machine on higher and pump it out yeah. you know that's a happy it's, problem um yeah <laughs> although people always say like what a good problem to have I'm like yeah you try having it's, this problem <laughs> it's still a problem yeah. it's still a really big problem right. i mean we ran we've run out of stuff already this season and like it's just not it's like yeah good problem to have but do you guys ever do sales with excess inventory we just do black friday black friday cyber monday and then we do like a, a one summer sale for our summer products but Try not to train people into just waiting around for a sale. Yeah, that's um, super smart. Um, yeah. When we started our company a long time ago, we actually ended up running Groupons. Really? So we were, we were New England-based company, yeah. and so we had sales coming from D.C., all like yeah. the, the hubs. And then but we had no sales coming from like L.A. or San Francisco. Yeah. And Groupon was a, was a thing at the time, and so we ended up running Groupons just to get to the West Coast. Yeah. And Does so we were okay devaluing the brand, let's say, on the West Coast for access. Yeah. But not on the East Coast. Right. And that ended up working. That's And great. it got us into these new markets. Yeah. But we were always so cognizant of that. If once you start any sort of sales, any sort of giveaways, it's like. People all just wait bad. around for it. Yeah. It's really bad. Yeah. 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 So we're trying to make sure we don't do that. And I think what our customer now knows is that like we sell out of the most popular things. So a lot of people won't wait around for the sale. Cause what's, what's, what's an example of some of the most popular things? Um, this hat, this white, our white gun beanie, our white motley, anything neutrals usually sell out, mm -hmm. but all of our new colors sold out really quickly this year. Our kid stuff. We did some really cute animal oh, ball stuff. clavas. Okay. Yeah. We, Is that new? We, yeah. It's our little shits line. <laughs> little shits line. Um, so we have like mommy and me matching hats. Um, so those sell pretty quickly. People spend a lot of money on kids. Oh my god! And um, we had Eva Chen wear our unicorn ball clava. She's the head of um, fashion at Instagram. Wow! So when she posted about that, we sold out of our unicorns. I know, didn't know Instagram insane. had a head of head of fashion. Yeah, she's pretty cool. She's I very guess fashionable. that makes sense. That's so when you sell out of products are you increasing that order for next year by x amount of percent is that how you kind of like look at it for sure and it's but it's still at the end of the day it's like a mix of art and science so it's mm -hmm. it's just not perfect like one year we hardly sold any pink hats like no one was buying them and then next year it's all people wanted mm -hmm. and i'd gone super conservative on our order because i don't want to have excess inventory and then and we had no pink yarn. So like, you know, it's right. just, you don't really know. And this year we did order a lot more of our white Motley and like we haven't completely sold through because we ordered so much more. Sure. But it's just, you just don't know. It's, Do you ever think about making a product with a celebrity? So it's like they kind of like a line or like yeah. one Shit's Creek wearing shit. That, that would be great. Yeah. Oh my God, I would die. Oh, that's good. Dan Levy. Yeah. That would be yeah. great, yeah. I actually sent him a hat. I don't think he wore oh. it, but <laughs> just because I'm a super, I've been a super fan since the beginning. Um, <laughs> it's a good show. It's, it's so good. Really funny. It's so funny. Um, it's so but yeah, we, we actually did our kids' ball clavas with Laria Baldwin. She's Alec Baldwin's wife. Okay. Um, and she's got a great mom following. So that was our first foray into collaborating with a celebrity. Um, and I think we'll do more of that. When you ship it, does it come with in a certain, like what, if someone unboxes it, what does yeah. it come with? Um, the hat comes in a dust bag that says, this is my shit. Um, 
I came up with that because my sisters always steal my things, so it's <laughs> mine. Um, so, and also as a way to store your hat during the summer months, or if you want to like shove it in your bag, you have something to put it in. Um, and then it has a card like about us and a return card, and then also a card about our team in uh, Peru. That's great. So one of their stories. And then actually people can go onto our website and write a thank you note to our team down in Lima. Oh, wow. Um, so we can share how much people love their hats. That's such with, a good idea. Yeah, it's really nice. And then you guys print them and send them over? Yeah, yeah and we um, they read them out loud to each other. And it's just kind of nice because like, they don't see the finished product. And they don't right. you know, just see how, how like crazy people are about them. And um, so it's nice to share that success with them. And I love that. Make sure they know yeah. how much we appreciate it. Where can um, people find your company? Um, www.shitthatiknit.com. <laughs> and what, what are you guys on Instagram? Shit that I knit. Shit that I knit. Yeah. Is it with an X or is it with an I? It's with an I. S H I T. Yeah. Shit that I Shit knit. Shit that I knit. Yeah. I love how explicit this is. Yeah. Yes. It makes it fun. <laughs> on our branding, though, it has the asterisks, you know. Yeah. Well, so thank you. PC. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having Thanks me. Thanks for sharing your story. Yeah. This is great. We here at Startup the Storefront would love to hear feedback from you. Reach out and let us know what you think, either through rating us on the podcast app or by sliding into our DMs. You can find us both on Facebook and Instagram at Startup the Storefront. Our theme song is composed by Double Touch. If you want to learn more about the products and businesses featured on today's episode, check out the links in the show notes. And if you enjoyed the episode, consider subscribing because we've got a lot more great guests coming up that you won't want to miss. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.